Good evening and welcome to our Book Passage Literary Event. My name is Karen West. I'm the Director of Events at Book Passage. And if you're new to joining us, I wanted to tell you that Book Passage is an independent bookstore. We've been selling and purveying books for over 40 years and offering lively discussions with the greatest and brightest minds throughout the world. And since the pandemic started, we launched a series of virtual events and you'll find many of them archived on our website. And this uh, event that you're watching tonight you'll be able to watch again on YouTube. You can go to YouTube and see what Book Passage is offering, but you'll want to share this event with your friends and family because tonight is going to be extraordinary. It's a difficult topic, but such an important one. I'm welcoming Tanya Selvaratnam today, who's an author, essay essayist, and filmmaker. But more than that, she's the most extraordinarily brave woman that has written a book about a relationship that she had with Eric Schneiderman, the Attorney General of New York, a seeming feminist, intellectual, a progressive man, on the outside it appeared to be, but inside was a man that was deeply destructive and she endured a very, very painful relationship and was willing with, as I said, great bravery and candor to talk about her story and what she went through. I think for so many people, when we think of people that get into an abusive relationship, we somehow have a habit of blaming the victim and thinking it was something they should have seen or done, the way they were raised. So many factors that we think something must have been wrong. But in Tanya, we have somebody who's bright, articulate, sensitive, aware, and yet she falls into this hell of a relationship and goes through the book and talks about it in such a way that we can see the entry point and how she goes into a world of madness and comes out the other side. And we are going to be better for her telling her story. She's joined today by Tiffany Schlain, one of my favorite local authors in the Bay Area, who wrote an incredible book called 24-6 about earning a day back in your life every single week by setting aside and eschewing your technology. And it really is life-changing work. Tiffany's a filmmaker, she's a writer, she's an influencer, she's a purveyor of and disseminates valuable information that changes people's lives. And she's a damn fine baker. And she's a sensitive woman that is the perfect comrade for an evening such as tonight. So I'm gonna place it in both of your hands. Tiffany and Tanya, please take it away. Oh, what a warm welcome. Well, first of all, well, first, I love Book Passage. It's my favorite independent bookstore. You hosted uh, many events for my father, Leonard Slane, and I feel this is the perfect place for Tanya to be, because actually Tanya and knew my father's work as well. And Tanya's, Tanya is one of my best friends. And this book is so courageous and brilliant and important. And I'm so happy that we're doing this because it, it's a tough subject. And I guess the first thing I want to say and ask you, Tanya, is um, not only are we good friends, but we've worked on activism together and um, especially in the last four years. And you've been such a, you fought for women's rights in your artwork, on stage, in your films. You, I mean, you've spent your career focused on empowering women. So was there a particular moment where you were like, how am I in this situation? I mean, I just, I would- There were many know. moments. Um, but first off, I just wanna say, Tiffany, I am so happy and I feel so like just blessed that on day one of my book launch, I am closing mm -hmm. it by having a conversation with you. It means so much to me. And this is why the sisterhood is so important. So I just, I love you. And I'm so grateful that you are having this conversation because it is a very difficult subject. It's in many of the details are embarrassing. They're shameful. They're hard to talk about. But I also feel that we have to take the shame and stigma out of intimate violence so that we can get closer to chipping away at the conditioning that normalizes it. Mm. As for like my activism and my advocacy for the rights and safety of women and children throughout my entire career and how I found myself in an abusive relationship. I wasn't prepared for my path to intersect with an abuser. I wasn't prepared for the grooming and gaslighting and manipulation. And by the time I realized that I was dealing with abuse and that I was in hell, I 
found it difficult to extricate myself. Mm. Abusers are very skilled at tapping into their victim's weakness. And my abuser was very skilled at tapping into mine. When we first met, which was in 2016 mm. at the Democratic Convention, it started like a fairy tale. It felt too good to be true. He was paying beautiful attention to me. He was adoring, he was supportive, he was admiring. And also we had common interests in progressive causes, in meditation and spirituality. We had both studied Chinese and spent time in China. And then over time, as we got to know each other, the darkness started to seep in. Mm -hmm. The criticism, the coercive control and the physical violence in the bedroom. When it first happened, it was jarring, it was shocking. It happened in the flash of an eye and it felt like he was testing me. And also because at that time, his star was rising. He was in the national spotlight more than ever. He was being worshiped as a liberal hero and as the top law enforcement officer of New York State. Mm. So there was a cognitive dissonance between this public facing feminist and progressive who privately abused me. And because the behavior seemed to come out of nowhere, I thought the abuse was specific to me. Mm. It was also so customized to me. Mm. You know, I have scars that run up and down my torso. Mm -hmm. And as one example of him tapping into my weakness, you know, I had a string of miscarriages and infertility and then cancer and then divorce a few years prior to my meeting Eric Schneiderman. And my scars are a marker of time before and after for me. And when he and I first met, he would look at my scars like a badge of courage. But then over time, he started criticizing them. He found them ugly. He wanted me to remove them. He wanted me to get plastic surgery. He also wanted me to get a boob job. Mm. And it just goes on and on. So, you know, I am ashamed about what I tolerated, but I'm also stronger for having come through on the other side. And I feel like I'm my strongest self ever now because I know that I will never tolerate that abuse again in any context. And I'm hopeful that the book can help others spot, stop and prevent intimate partner violence in their own lives and in the lives of their loved ones. Yeah, like there's so much there. I mean, first, just as one of your um, friends, you know, and we got very close, you and I, um, after the, in 2016, right, when you started dating him. And I remember just thinking, and it's just one of those examples of you never know what's going on behind closed doors because you two look like just this shining democratic light. And he was lauded. And this was like, the Me Too movement was starting to happen. And, and he was being awarded as like this champion for women. And you know, you and I made a reproductive rights film together. I mean, it was like this this double helix world going on of who he projected to be, what we all hoped he was, and just as a friend, I was super psyched you were in love. And it just it's I think that what you're doing is so important because the Me Too movement was really about well, powerful men abusing situations and abusing people, but this is really a, a different element that you are opening the door for. And I feel like we have seen it in the news in the last month too of intimate, intimate violence, which I love that that is your tagline, a story, and I'm gonna hold up your book because it feels good to hold, but a story of intimate violence. And I think that just take there, it's such a powerful combination of words. And I am sure during the pandemic, as so many people are like trapped in their homes, they can't leave if that, was even in there in the beginning, it's only been exacerbated. So if you could talk a little bit about this other side of the Me Too movement and, and the pandemic, what you've, the numbers you've seen um, about intimate violence during the pandemic. Well, I feel that, as you mentioned, the stories that we've just seen in the last month 
I've been grateful for and also very saddened by the stories that FKA Twigs and Evan Rachel Wood have shared about their experiences with intimate violence with powerful men. Yeah. I was, it really, um, it, 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 it struck a nerve with me that we were at very different life stages when we were abused. Mm. We were separated by generations, but united by trauma. Mm -hmm. And we were on the outside, strong, financially independent and successful, but privately we were abused. And I believe it's important to shift the perception of what a victim looks like. A victim looks like all of us and even fierce women get abused. Mm -hmm. And I really feel that we are at the next wave of the Me Too movement. I can feel the dam beginning to break where we talk about intimate violence in committed relationships, mm -hmm. which is a very insidious form of violence. It happens behind closed doors. Typically there are only two witnesses, the victim and the abuser. Mm -hmm. And it's very hard to talk about. It's very shameful. And by my sharing the micro details of what I experienced, as humiliating as they are, I hope to open up a conversation so that other people can recognize it in their own lives. And the, it, it, there is just so much work to do to chip away at the conditioning that normalizes the cycle of violence mm. because the abusers are subject to that conditioning as well. You know, mm. we're conditioned to accept it and they're conditioned to inflict it. Mm. Yeah, I mean, the book is very powerful because you are so honest and, and you're also a great writer, but the vulnerability I think is the most courageous thing when someone is just incredibly honest. And when you speak your truth, you're speaking to some universal truth and you just have to know that. And I, and I was also just thinking as a writer, um, it must have been so difficult to go back there. And did you, like when I write, I, I was getting up like really early and writing for two chunks and then I would go about my day, but I don't even, like, were you able to do that? I mean, I'm just, this is more like a creative writing process question because it was so difficult, this stuff. Did you like go away and write it all at once or what was your process to relive this very painful period of your life? Well, I wrote my way out of the darkness mm. and I'm grateful that I'm a writer. I'm grateful that I'm an artist. I, I say, you know, when life throws me lemons, make art. And mm. that's what I tried to do with this. But also I wanted to write a book that would draw readers in with the narrative and mm. give them resources so yeah. that they could spot and stop and prevent intimate partner violence. The writing process itself. So I've always been an intrepid note taker. I have hundreds of sets of notes in my phone and my journal. And Are you a big journaler? I mean, is that part of you? I am too. Like, I'm a big write? journaler and yeah. my, I, I, I write down my dreams. Do you write down your like, dreams? Yes, I say I'm like a reporter for my own life. I'm like, and this happened and this made me excited and this inspired me and this made me upset. And this is like, it's therapy, it's self therapy for me. Well, well you're writing it out. Yeah. You know, Absolutely. and and also you and I are both documentary filmmakers. Yeah, yeah, we're storytellers. Right. And and uh, and so as a storyteller and a documentary filmmaker, and also with a background in academia, and even uh, as importantly, as someone who grew up very shy and introverted, writing things out was my way of dealing with mm -hmm. hard times. Yeah. So that I could write them out, look back and understand them for myself. Mm -hmm. It was my, my way of getting things out. And when I started to write this book, uh, I took all the notes that I had been keeping. I put them into one document. I printed it out. Mm -hmm. It turned out to be about 300 pages worth, which shocked me. And I had the structure for the book in my head before I started writing the book. And I knew I wanted to structure it with the stages that one goes through to get into an abusive relationship. And then about halfway through the book, the script flips when I 
extricate myself right. and start to understand the domestic violence crisis and the signs of an intimate violent relationship. And it's when I start to have more agency over my body, over my life and over my narrative. So I had the structure for the book. So I sat down with these hundreds of pages of notes. I was in Portland, Oregon, which is where I feel I do my best writing. Mm -hmm. And I marked the notes, each little section with what chapter it should go into. And then I did, and you will understand this, like a documentary filmmaker, I created totally. a string, I created yeah. a string out of each <laughs> chapter mm. in a separate file. Mm. And then I read through each string out and I added textures, layers, colors, mm. scenes, vibrancy, the way we approach films mm. to, to, to make it pop, to make it come alive. So it, it, that was the writing process for me. And there were parts of the writing that were very painful and emotional, just reliving the experiences that I had gone through and uh, how much I had tolerated and the memories that I would have to grapple with probably for the rest of my life. Mm -hmm. um, there were times when I felt like my heart was burning down. Mm -hmm. um, I cried a lot. I listened to all the sad songs, but then mm. there were also times that I looked back at and I felt very comforted. I felt comforted by the friends and colleagues and the art mm. around me. Um, and I knew that I would be okay. And that by letting myself go through the pain and the trauma uh, that I would come out on the other side and find my light. And I hope that readers find their light through this book as well. Oh, well, that, that was one of the most powerful parts of the book for me was not only did you very bravely share your story um, with color and texture and vulnerability, but then the last part of the book, the appendix is like this incredible resource section, which is so needed, like, you know, breaking down the different forms of abuse, whether it's physical, emotional, digital, resources, statistics, ways to get help. I mean, it, it really combines both of like this very powerful story to help you understand this huge epidemic and then a way for people that are reading it to get out. So I encourage any of you listening, a um, couple things, if you, if you have any questions to put it into the YouTube chat and they will get zoomed over to us, but also to get this book for anyone that you might be worried about because it's a very difficult subject. Um, I mean, I even, I remember when you, the New Yorker story broke and you were in hiding. I mean, this is like serious um, fear. Um, and I think the gift that you've given to women and I'm sure some men, um, uh, is a handbook also to what are the steps you need to take and what do you need to do to get out of the situation. So um, what was your process, I mean, when you were making the resource guide? And you, would you wanna tell us about how you were guided to help you identify what was going on and to make plan, you had to make a plan to get out of the situation. And Eric Schneiderman, I mean, I was right along from the West Coast cheering him on as being the one person that could take down Trump. That was like, there was a whole year where he was the guy. So talk to us about just that whole process of like, oh my God, should I go to the, should I talk to the New Yorker? I mean, that must've been such a complicated, you're such a political activist. And then, I mean, I just can't even imagine how you grappled with that. Well, I didn't write a political book I wrote a book about intimate violence, right. but because of who my abuser was, the politics inevitably are a part of my story. Mm -hmm. There was a lot of pressure on me not to come forward because he was seen as an important politician who was on a path to becoming potentially governor of New York state. And he had many powerful allies mm -hmm. and I, was scared of what might happen to my career and reputation. Mm. But there were a couple of turning points that are cosmic. Mm. Um, the first was that 
I have a friend who's like my sister and she could sense that I was going through a hard time. Many friends sense that I was going through a hard time for many, many, many months mm -hmm. um, throughout the year of 2017 until Eric and I parted ways. Um, they would comment that I seemed subdued in the relationship, that I didn't see myself. Mm -hmm. And I would say things like, you know, he's depressed, he's having a hard time. I told some of them about the drinking and the controlling behavior, but because he was considered this hero of the left, I was protecting him. Yeah. I also felt that if I told them exactly what I was going through, that I wouldn't be able to take it back. And he knew that he had problems. He knew that he had a drinking problem and addiction problem, and that he, um, he said he was gonna get help. And I held on to that hope. And also abusers, aside from being very skilled at tapping into your weaknesses, they're also very skilled at making you feel that they need you. Mm. And that if you leave them, you are harming them. Mm. So this had been going on for many months, but one friend reached out to me and she said, you know, she was like, T, what's going on? And I said, things are rocky. It's not good. And I, I told her about the drinking and the controlling behavior. And then she asked me, does he hit you? Mm. And because she's like my sister and I wasn't gonna lie to her, I said, yes. Mm. And she, I could feel her anger through the phone. And she said, I want you to talk to somebody. And it was a friend of hers who's a domestic violence expert. Mm. So I was fortunate that one of my closest friends has a friend who's a domestic violence expert. And I spoke with this woman, Jennifer Friedman, a few days later. And she really helped me understand that what I had gone through was classic domestic abuse, mm. that all the signs were there. You know, abuse takes many forms and that is um, not well understood, that it's not only physical abuse, it's emotional, it's verbal, it is digital abuse, legal abuse. There are many, many forms of abuse. Mm -hmm. And I had, uh, I had experienced various forms of abuse in my situation. And uh, she also said, Tanya, the likelihood is that he has done this to other women. Right. Which was mind blowing to me because I really thought that the abuse was specific to me. Mm. Um, Eric fooled a lot of people, but he was also shielded by a lot of people. He was surrounded by supposed feminists, by meditators, and also his ex-wife, mm. who was right. his, uh, you know, who was his advisor. So I was really, uh, there was a kind of smoke screen around him. Did they reach out to you during this whole period? I mean, were they trying to shape the story or they knew his, I mean, were they contacting you? You mean when Did, I was in the relationship? Or, or would they, yeah, after either, either. Like, were they trying to shield him? No. Uh, what they, they didn't reach out to me, but what um, some of them were doing um, after the New Yorker story became public is they were trying to discredit me and the New Yorkers reporting behind the scenes. Now, I'm a nobody, but it just so happens no, by coincidence. Well, no, 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 but uh, it just so happens that I have many friends who are reporters, mm -hmm. um, incredible investigative journalists. And they told me about the people that were trying to discredit me behind the scenes. And I'm not gonna say their names because I don't want okay. them coming after yeah. me, but they're very powerful. They're supposedly feminist. A lot of them are, are women. Mm -hmm. um, and I was just like, you know, I didn't even try to wrap my head around it. I, I, the cults of personality that form around rich people, powerful people, talented people who are abusers are very damaging to the people who are in those cults. And mm -hmm. they're also damaging to society. And part of the challenge ahead is to chip away at that kind of power over culture, the mm -hmm. scarcity culture and uplift a true power culture where people can rise together, where there mm -hmm. is abundance. So with many of these perpetrators, there is an enabler 
And that enabler is often sadly a woman, which is what I discovered in my situation with Eric Schneiderman. But, you know, moving on from them, I, <laughs> um, you know, there is a thing, it's the white female patriarchy, um, but moving on from them. So another pivotal moment was when I went many weeks later to gather my belongings from Eric's apartment, which I had left there after we parted ways. The domestic violence expert was, she was so clear. She has dealt with thousands of cases. Mm. And she said to me, don't worry about your things. Your safety is important. Your recovery is important. Eventually you will get them. Mm. And if you do go and get them, go with a friend. And I, um, a friend of mine offered to go with me. She happens to be an investigative journalist, Jennifer Gonerman. And I'm so grateful to her. She said to me when we were at Eric's apartment get, getting all my belongings, she said, you know, he can't, you can't be the first person he's done this to. Mm. In less than 24 hours, she had identified a previous girlfriend of Eric's who had an eerily similar experience. Mm. And that's when I felt the scales just fall off of my eyes. Mm. I had been part of a pattern. Mm -hmm. And that's when like the thriller aspects of the book really kick in. Yeah. Um, yeah. So those were, the, those were the pivotal moments for me. And how do you feel now? I mean, you've spoken your truth with such courage and clarity. And, you know, I'm so grateful you had this friend who knew someone for you to talk to, but you're really providing in this book a way for any reader to find that person that's going to help them get out of the situation, which is this incredible, I mean, the ripple effect of your courage is going to be huge. And, but now, okay, you told us about the writing process. This book is now, on, this is pub date. <laughs> It's on the today. How do you, today, I'm so <laughs> proud of you. But how do you, how do you feel now? I mean, you have spoken your truth in a very clear, powerful way. And how are you, how are you feeling? I feel good about the writing of the book. I hope that people read it. I hope they pass it along. I really hope that high school students read it mm. because when you know that one in four women and one in 10 men experience intimate partner violence during their lifetimes, and millions of them experience it before they turn 18 years old, the education needs to start earlier. Mm. And, uh, and, and so I really hope that high school students read it and I hope that they enjoy it and that it helps them have healthier relationships. Um, and uh, so I'm excited for the book to be out there. It's a very different experience uh, than when my story the of intimate lie. violence, uh, well, it's very different from the big lie because yeah. the big lie, I was taking the shame and stigma out of infertility, mis yeah. miscarriage and infertility. Yeah. Um, but there's something very different about the stigma and shame around intimate violence. Mm -hmm. Well, because you know, there's so much wrapped up in our sexualities. Well, that I wanted to get into that because mm. I, I have a lot of friends with boys and they're, the boys are watching a lot of porn starting at age eight to onward. And what yeah. they're watching, I mean, anyone, like I was curious, what are they watching? Just type in, you know, I'm not gonna, <laughs> there's kids in the house, but immediately what comes up, you're like, oh my gosh, that is what they think that women want. And so there's this whole element here, which I th you really touched upon well, which I thought, you know, because sexuality is complicated what turns people on and what when they cross a line and what pornography projects as what is sexy what's going to turn a woman on i mean i feel like it's so distorted in this fun house mirror of pornography available on every device right now and it feels like that's just the super important part of this kind of exploration we need to do as a society with what's happening intimately and why is it happening and of course there's cycles of abuse which is very real but the porn stuff i mean what do you think about all that i am so glad you brought that up because the 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 book very much celebrates it it it, it 
wants to chip away at the cycle of violence, but I celebrate sexual pleasure. Right. And, part, part, and, and part of that is, you know, these guys, these abusers, they're all watching the same porn. Right. And it's porn that glorifies violence against women. And right. I feel that we need more female and female feminist porn, porn, porn. directors <laughs> making films that yeah. celebrate mutual pleasure. Mm -hmm. And like, you know, uh, sexual pleasure comes in all forms. And what might be kinky for one is totally normal for another. Uh, but a key component of BDS BDSM is consent. Right. And in my experience, and in the experience of the other previous girlfriends of Eric Schneiderman, there was no consent asked for or granted. Mm. It was a slap hard across the face out of nowhere. Uh, so yeah. I, I really think, you know, I mean, Tiffany, maybe we, we, we you, uh, you and I have collaborated <laughs> on election-related films. You and I have collaborated on Planned Parenthood <laughs> films. I think maybe we need to make some great <laughs> porn. Well, you know, this is going to be a little, I mean, just because as we're talking about it, you know, it was just Valentine's Day and I was looking for <laughs> a good movie for my husband to watch. And I was like trying to find Betty Blue, which I loved. Yes. They, they do not show it online anymore. It was so sad. Oh. And I was like, what about nine and a half weeks? Which I remember when they came <laughs> Oh my God. No, Tanya, it's exactly what we're talking about. Nine and a half weeks. I mean, it's not exactly, but I watched it in the 80s and I haven't. It's like New York in the 80s, Mickey Rourke, Kim Basinger at their hottest. And there's definitely some sexy moments in it. But then you can see when this line is totally crossed. It's totally crossed. And yeah. he keeps crossing it. And actually it reminded me just cause I saw it this last weekend in your story, because it's so subtle. Like at first, like they're so in love and there's sexiness. And then it's like, whoa, you just crossed the line. I'll forgive that. Oh my God, you just crossed another line. And then, oh my God. Like, I think what that movie showed was how slippery of a slope the seduction mm -hmm. is. And it really felt like in a cinematic way, it was just showing what you're talking about. Mm. Um, because it, I think these fine lines between, um, the, all these kind of power dynamics and mm -hmm. the no consent and then keep on crossing that line. And then the power dynamic becomes really distorted. Um, so I think what your book does a really good job of, of like owning your power of saying no and like, okay, that I did not enjoy that. That was not, um, mutual <laughs> that. And, and that scared me. And there's a moments in the book where you're just like, oh my, you know, and I think that um, that was very powerful for me is how you really captured those moments because it's like those moments when time stops when you're like, what just happened? Yes. And, and I love this person. And I love this person. And that reconciling those emotions must have just been um, so intense. It was intense, but I want to go back to porn. <laughs> or um, nine and a half weeks. No, I'm now, now I'm getting You're really like excited about the thought about you and I making some really <laughs> kick-ass <laughs> porn. Because it, 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 it is part of why we have this insidious intimate violence. I, I can't, you know, one of the reasons I wrote the book is because so many people, men and women, reached out to me friends and strangers sharing their own stories of intimate violence. Mm. And many of them talked about slapping, spitting, and choking in the bedroom. Mm. And it's and that's like- in so where, much porn. Exactly, so much porn. that is in so much porn. Where are they learning these behaviors? And I, this also brings up how responsible our media culture and social media culture is for allowing the proliferation of this violence and vitriol. And they hide behind the Communications Decency Act, but it's like, are, are they that naive? No, they're just following the money. They know that it makes them a lot of money. So mm -hmm. they're, they're sticking to it. So the laws need to change. 
And we need to hold these companies accountable because it's like, and this is something your father understands so well. Mm -hmm. And, 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 you know, and I spoke about him in the present tense. So it's something that your father. That's okay. He's so still, well. he's still here. He's, he's here right here. now, really enjoying this conversation. Yes. Um, no, because and, it's the whole power dynamic in our society of men and women and, um, the image and language and, I, I mean, I couldn't agree with you more. I'm on a couple boards that are working, you know, with the internet, just, you know, there's no um, protection for kids. I mean, what we're talking about with porn yeah. starts so young. Mm -hmm. and this is, it's seated so young on, that's what they think women want. They want to be hit, mm -hmm. they turned over and spit on and, you know, that's what they think because we're showing them that. So yes. how do you place controls and, um, I mean, somebody was telling me that Pinterest is full of porn. I was like, yes. I mean, so I think it's so pervasive and, and because it's not being talked about enough. So in sex ed, like a whole section should be about this is most of this porn is made by men and they are creating this um, storyline that isn't accurate for women. Mm -hmm. And it's propagating this myth that women want this. Right. And, yeah. We need a total narrative shift around sexual pleasure. Um, and we have to make peace more exciting than violence. We have to make pleasure more exciting than violence. Right. And I do think it's possible because it feels better. You know, violence is addictive because it's like adrenaline inducing. It's endorphin inducing. It's like a, dr it's like a drug. But I, I, I feel that there's a way to make pleasure as exciting. And so that's our big challenge, uh, I think, moving forward. But also, you know, the media platforms that hide behind the laws um, and impunity, like we're just providing a platform, we don't take responsibility. You know, right. people can just make, people so have cowardly. free, people have yeah. free will. People can make up their own minds. It's like, they know the science. It is cognitive science 101, that repetitive messaging mm -hmm. and emotionally triggering messaging can imprint behaviors and thought processes, mm -hmm. which is why I say it's something that your father understands so well. Completely. And the more that, you know, everything you watch and read is strengthening certain parts of your brain and weakening others. And if you're strengthening that dopamine, the amygdala, the fear, mm -hmm. you're going to want more of that. I mean, I think that is what the internet unfortunately has become is just this amygdala, you know, just trying to create fear, stressful news headlines, stressful images, you turn off the news violence and everything is about getting your attention because yes. the news and media just wants to keep your eyes glued to the screen. So they're going to do whatever it takes. And the, the quickest way to do that is through fear. And so I think it should be called the amygdala media because like, what are they creating is just this fear-based um, dopamine addiction that, I mean, it would, it would just be so much more um, helpful for humans, for our species and for society, if that wasn't what was the driving force. When you said amygdala media, it's like yeah. a, my brain kind of like- Is that the name of our new production company? <laughs> that I, we need to stamp out? <laughs> I was just, that's what I was just wondering. <laughs> so Tanya and I, I mean, totally separately, just she's an amazing filmmaker. And um, we made this film um, for Planned Parenthood. And we both, she spearheaded um, artists for Biden Harris. And we got to meet every week leading up to the election. And she's so amazing to see in action. I have to say, just, it's such a pleasure. I know we're talking about your book, but I think what's an important element of this book is you're not a nobody. You're an amazing artist and you're, you're a powerful woman. I mean, I think of you as just this woman who is so creative and intelligent and you make things happen. I mean, I think that in such a, I mean, really it's an amazing thing to be on the other side of you producing something. You're an amazing producer. And well, creator. the feeling is mutual. I think that's why <laughs> we love each other. I know we love working together. You know, well, I mean, it turns up and Tiffany lets it ripple. <laughs> Oh my God, that's awesome. Let it ripple is the name of my production company. Turn, Tanya Turns Up is her website. It's amazing. Um, okay, but we're filmmakers. So immediately, of course, I'm like, 
I mean, I'm right now working on developing my book into a series because I think visually, I mean, I love the creative challenge of, okay, you're only going to get words on a page. And that's a super intense creative constraint that I love much more than yeah. I thought. I don't have the images. I don't have the music. I don't have the collaborators. And I loved that. But now after I've written the book, I'm really excited to turn it into a series because there's so many ideas that I can, I feel like I can only really get to through this combination of images and sounds and whatever. So I imagine, I mean, since you are a filmmaker, have you thought about trying to articulate the importance of these ideas in a film? The film has, the, the book has been optioned by ABC okay. Signature Disney <laughs> Television. So the answer is yes. Um, will you I did be not involve creatively or does that kind of thing? Yes, you... I'm working with an amazing team. Um, okay. So again, it's ABC Signature Disney Television and Joanna Coles um, is executive producing. Awesome. And she read an early manuscript of the book and very quickly said um, that she wanted to turn it into a series that this is a message that should get out there. And also because it reads like a thriller, you know? Mm, so that was um, a very exciting thing for me because I want the message to get out to a larger audience. Mm -hmm. And we're in active development right now. Um, and uh, hopefully we'll make some big announcements soon. Okay, but, we um, all yeah, how, they well, actually, how can people quickly, like- Because the time is now. Yeah, if people want to follow you um, and your work, what's the best platform for them to sign up for your newsletter? Yeah, she does a great newsletter on our website. I um, mean, we do have a question from the audience that I wanted to bring up, which I didn't bring up earlier, but I it is it's a great question. So um, you've spoken as a child as witnessing your parents abusive relationship. And how do you think that experience impacted your own relationships? Because this was your first experience in an, in an abusive relationship, then, right? And we're about the same age. So it's not like it was a pattern for you your whole life. No, my, uh, my experience as an adult uh, in an abusive relationship with Eric was the very first time for me. But as a child, I grew up uh, witnessing horrific domestic violence between my parents. It was, um, I, I'm, I can't believe what I watched as a child. And uh, one of my most vivid memories that's in the book is of me holding a stuffed bunny in one hand and crying at the top of my lungs while my father is beating my mother. Mm. And I, the juxtaposition of the violent scene I was witnessing and the comfort that this stuffed bunny was giving me Mm -hmm. um, is forever in my mind. Um, I, it, I always considered myself a strong person. I would stand up to my father. I would stand between him and my mother when he was trying to hit her. I tried to get her to divorce him, but my mother did not have the support network, mm -hmm. um, to help her get out. And also not only was intimate violence so stigmatized um, amongst her generation and in our South Asian community, but also divorce was stigmatized. Mm. So she was scared to get out. Where would she go? How would she support herself? Mm. And uh, when I experienced this as an adult, well, for one thing, it looked different mm. because my father would hit my mother in the public spaces of the house, in the living room, the dining room. And also my mother had bruises, a black eye, a bloody tooth. But the physical violence with me and Eric happened only in the sexual context, in the bedroom. And although he slapped me hard, I never had bruises. You know, again, I was dealing with the top law enforcement officer of New York State. So mm. I think he might have known to some extent his limits of how much harm he could inflict. Mm. But the, uh, the course of control that I experienced was also very different. You know, it was interesting, like my, my mother experienced much more extreme physical violence 
I feel like I experienced uh, not more extreme, but very extreme coercive control with Eric trying to control what I ate and how I dressed. And uh, for instance, he didn't want me eating sweets. He didn't want me eating chicken. He's a pescatarian. Um, mm -hmm. I, I, you know, I am, I eat chicken um, <laughs> and, and he didn't want me eating chicken. Uh, made me feel like I was evil for eating chicken. And it's just not normal for uh, for a partner to control the way a woman in her 40s eats like that. What What has, I mean, because you talk about your family and, in the book, write about it, and what has been the reaction? Because you're shining a light not only in the situation, but in this larger cycle and how has that been for you as a truth sayer? I think it was important for me to excavate the fractures mm -hmm. in myself that I needed to heal. Yeah. And the fractures of my father fractured me. Mm. And I hope that my family is forgiving of that. I think that my father would want me to tell the truth about what he did. Um, he was, he never hit me. He and I talked easily, we got along, um, but the abuse he inflicted on my mother was uh, like frightening. It was frightening. Do you, do you think that I am a believer, my mother's a therapist, and I think a lot about can people evolve out of that situation? Can they get out of the cycle? And do you believe that Eric or other people that may be violent can, can get out of that pattern? I believe that if an abuser is willing to do the hard work, and it is very hard work to outroot their abusive behavior, then they are capable of redemption. I believe in restorative justice. I, I believe, believe in that. second. Yeah. I believe in yeah. second chances. But the problem is that most abusers do not put in that work, or they give it up part way, mm -hmm. and you need to follow it through. And there are a lot of programs for to to help abusers stop being abusive, mm -hmm. but um, there have been many studies about these programs for perpetrators and the high attrition rates out of them. So mm -hmm. what needs to happen is, in addition to improved education starting from a young age and improved um, public awareness and better sex education and porn. Um, there all and more accountability of the media. There also needs to be improved legislation that mm. is victim centered, that incorporates restorative justice, and that has more repercussions and accountability for abusers. So that, for instance, there have been some jurisdictions where they've instituted penalties if a you know a predator is put into a program and doesn't show up. But unless you have those penalties in place, there's less incentive for them to show up. So mm. there's like a whole ecosystem that needs to be transformed. I, because you are involved in politics, in addition, I mean, are there people that you're talking to about maybe starting some legislation around this? I mean, it seems like you'd be the perfect person to bring this all together. So I, um, uh, I am actually, um, I recently joined the board of DV Leap, mm -hmm. which is a, a national organization that provides pro bono legal services for uh, appeals in mm -hmm. domestic violence cases. And um, I just recently joined. So I'm really looking forward to working mm -hmm. with them after I get through the book tour. And then uh, another position that I recently started is uh, I'm the senior advisor for gender justice narratives for the pop culture collaborative. Oh, and, and so I'm hoping to, um, to work on kind of the narrative shift that needs to happen. 
mm. around gender justice. So yes, this is um, definitely the work that I will plan to be doing. And then I'm hopeful that through the series development, which is, it's not a, a it's not a documentary, it's gonna be a dramatization. Oh. And I, I'm really giving them free reign to take the, the the narrative, you know, because what's on the page is going to translate very differently to screen, and I, as a filmmaker, know that. So I really want them to have the freedom to to translate the series into um, into a piece of art that's really going to resonate on a mass scale. Wow, that is going to be an interesting process of having yourself cast and. Um, watching it would be a true out of body experience to <laughs> watch that happen Oof. i haven't I even mean, thought about that yet it's an out of body i mean it's literally an out of body experience that i mean i always think of that i only do documentaries now but at the beginning of my career when i i did a narrative and like you think of an idea and then the actors come out and they're doing what's in your head but you had an experience that is going to be cast and <laughs> created, that is gonna be wild. I mean, I think also hard. And um, mm. and then what if they don't quite get it, right? <laughs> like you'll have to make sure, like, no, no, that, I mean, I feel like it's important that you're creatively involved, which I'm really happy about because you are a filmmaker and to kind of get that, th those moments that we were just talking about before of like, that moment when you're like, you can't believe it shifted into this direction. Like those moments are gonna be so important to get right mm -hmm. and to treat with all the nuance and complication that you expressed in words. Um, yeah. I'm glad you have a good team. I mean, I think it's gonna be interesting. I mean, I think this whole thing is, is just an act of courage, you know, I think, um, you really inspire me as an artist and as a writer and um mutually well i just i i i just had a thought tiffany who's gonna play you I'm not, well in my in my series i'll be doing what i do in my documentaries where i show up at the beginning the middle and the end so uh -huh. i'm kind of playing me i'm playing me i don't no, think no, I no, can... but in, in my movie or your movie um who, oh, oh who, who would play, play you who should play me? I don't know. I see we're almost out of time. This would and be an interesting question for the audience. But um, <laughs> who would play Tanya and who would play Tiffany? <laughs> That's going to be people something. People can post in the YouTube as like a final part. Oh, yeah, and we'll get to look at it at the end. We'll get to look at it at the end. Oh, Tanya, this has been such a pleasure. I know it was hard and I was like nervous about the subject, but excited to go deep and wide and in all the different places we went. So first of all, congratulations on your publication date. It's such a journey. It's such a huge day. It's the last event of your day. I'm sure you're going to, I hope you have a stiff drink and go to sleep or take a bath. Well, I haven't been eating. You know, a friend of mine asked, how are you doing? And my answer that's made them all laugh is like, I wish someone would make me dinner. And, I wish I could make you dinner. Oh. And and one friend said, oh, if I lived near you, I would bring you over my famous eggplant Parmesan. Oh. And I have all these friends. But then a friend of mine sent me a bag full of food. Oh, that's of a hot friend. food. And because oh I just didn't have time to cook because, you know, that I've, been, I've been doing interviews from oh 8 a.m. until now, you know, 10 p.m. here. Oh my gosh. And um, and my agent sent me a basket full of fruit. It's like oh. so much fruit. I don't know what I'm going to do with it all. I'll have to so like, happy. well, next time so I'm I finally have food. It's been a couple of days since I've eaten a proper meal. Well, I can't. And actually, where you're filming, I've actually stayed because I've stayed in Tanya's apartment before in New York. So I feel like I wish I could be in your apartment. I know cooking you a really yummy meal. And then we'd have a glass of wine. But we're doing it virtually. Yeah, um, this has been and so great. And I congratulations. And Karen, do you want to yeah. come on to take us? Oh, uh, <laughs> yeah, I want to just I want to Tanya, I want to thank you so much for your bravery in doing this. I'm so sorry you went through this, but by b being willing to talk about it so openly, you're gonna change people's lives. I liked what you said about give this to high school women, have them understand what could be out there and, and how to avoid it and, and lots of things that would like um, change people's lives and the wonderful section at the back of the book with all the resources. I was just like, 
Thank you. Thank you for that. <laughs> this book is just packed full of information. It's such a tender, touching story, hard, but such important, relevant work in this time. And literally, you're going to change lives. Yes. And I hope you will buy this book for people. I want to say for Book Passage, we're online. Both of our stores are open. We're at the Ferry Building and Corte Madera with the doors open. But 24 hours a day, you can order this online. And Tiffany, everybody, thank you for giving me that day back in my life that I have through your book. <laughs> yes, yeah. I have Tiffany's book yeah. too. Oh, yes. wait, we're doing, we're going to kiss our books. All of us are going to do it. He's going to do it. We're kissing the book. <laughs> Literally. But yes, book passage, go into Book Passage also, and you can go into their store because we just got lifted. We're in the red zone now. You can yes. go in the store and enjoy Book Passage again, too. Yes, oh, that's amazing. You know, I did an in-person event at Book Passage for The Big Lie. It's such you a great show. And I forgot that you did for The Big Lie. And I so wish you could be with us in person, but doing it this way and... Tiffany, thank you for being such a sensitive, tender interviewer. And you oh, too. I want to see your she porn made it easy. started. I want good porn for women. <laughs> good porn. Amygdala media. Amygdala media. <laughs> okay. Well, for all that came watching, out of a book passage talk. <laughs> seriously, we'll have it. So, everybody, I'm wishing you a good night. You can watch this on YouTube. And uh, really, Tanya, congratulations. And thank you. Most of all, thank you for doing this really mm. important work touched by both of you tonight. So thank you so much for oh, that. Oh, right. thank you, us. Karen. We love Book Passage. Yay. Good night, everybody. Good thank night. You.